strictly today. Um, we're going to have a very interesting discussion. I'd like to welcome everyone who is here today. Uh, uh, welcome for showing up. Um, the message will be available online as well. It's been recorded. Um, so, I, and I want to encourage everyone, please pay attention. Uh, by God's grace, we will not listen to man, we will listen to God. Uh, this will not be preached by me alone. We're going to share a few thoughts together. So get ready to uh, understand how you can lift up your hand and how you can signal and put a comment there that you want to share because you will have opportunities to share. I'm going to share my screen very quickly and then we'll get into the heart of what God has for us for today. Um, thank God for all the testimonies. Thank God for what God is doing in our lives. This morning in, uh, at the offline service, we were overwhelmed and embarrassed with testimonies. There was no room to preach. Uh, and it was a joy to listen at the things that God was doing in people's lives, the progress that people were making. It is amazing. And I, I want to just say I'm grateful to God uh, for what he's doing in our, in our midst. I'm grateful to God for how people are growing, how people are growing out of where they were into what God has in store for them, how their lives are being beautified by God, and how it can only be God. Praise God. Now, very quickly today, um, we're going to be covering a very interesting topic, but I'd like to always remind us what our theme for this year is. Our theme for this year is how to be effortlessly productive in this year. And I don't know about you, uh, but I see already that productivity happening in many lives. I can see already people achieving things by those says the Lord. And if you are here in the house today and you see that you are being productive, being productive in the things that God has placed in your hands to do, you can see that productivity happening. It's just four months down, eight months to go, and you are enjoying that productivity. Just type in that chat box, praise God. You know, I like us to you know respond, participate, and type in that comment box. Praise God! Let everybody see that God is doing things in your life, and you are enjoying that productivity. Now, this was the stream that we followed for this year, and today we are going further. Uh, and I like to say, you know, have clear expectations. Uh, the expectations that means we we'll have a very simple expectations. I expect God to give you revelation. You know, one of the things that is most important that we can get in God's presence is a revelation. Revelation is precious. It's as precious, more precious than gold. Expect that God will give you clarity about his word, about his truth, and deep revelation. Expect that miracles will happen. Okay, that there will be signs and there will be wonders. Expect that God will transform you from inside out, that you will change. Expect that you'll be loaded with a new, you know, a bountiful, uh, with, with bounties of joy and peace. Expect a supply of God's grace that where you found it difficult before, where you struggled in your own strength, expect God's grace to carry you through in ways that are beyond your imagination. And expect that when this message is over today, you will, by virtue of the words you have heard, produce a harvest of a hundredfold and have testimonies to share in Jesus' name. I pray that that will be your portion as well as mine in Jesus' name. So today we're going to go a step further. I'm laying the foundation for the theme of what this month will be about. And I'm thinking the month of May, it may stretch into the month of June, but we're going to be looking at solving real life problems with Christ lens. Okay. And uh, this is the general theme we want to address this month. And, you know, as I was sharing, as I was putting on the slide here, I said, we all see through lenses. Every human being amongst us looks at life with a tinted glass. We all see life through a particular lens. Some use the lens of science and they look at things, they see the scientific explanation, they're very logical in their mindset, they see things from science's view. Some use the lens of their experiences. This has happened to me before, it mustn't happen to me again. Like they say, the fire of carelessness cannot burn twice. If I was careless the first time, I can't be careless again. That means I'm using the lens of my experience. Once beaten, twice shy, is a manifestation of the lens of experience. Some people live from their experiences. Some other people live from the, ex from the lens of history. They say those who do not know the things that happened before them are bound to repeat it. And someone in that school of thought says, he that does not know the, you know, the things that happened in the past is forever a child. So people look at life through the lens of history. 
and they say in 1937 it happened, in 1987 it happened. You know, the best prediction of the future is the past, and they rely on history to navigate the future. They are based on the history, the lens of history. Some people use the lens of training, the fact that they have been taught and tutored and brought up in a particular way, their background, you know, their environment, their culture, their training has made them to deal with issues in a certain way. And those people, whenever they have an issue or have a problem, they use the lens of training. Some other people use the lens of influences. We are influenced by people. We have people who have influence over us. We have people who, by virtue of you know, their proximity to us, can influence us by virtue of the authority they have on the mountains of influence that they occupy. They can influence us by virtue of the culture. We find ourselves around, we can be influenced. And some people look at life through the lens of their influences. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what lens you use to look at life, but today we want to take a very interesting look at how to look at life from the lens of Jesus, not just the Bible, and how to solve our life, daily life issues, understanding that we have a lens that we can look at life with, and it's a different lens. Ladies and gentlemen, all these lenses that I've analyzed here manifest in our lives in various ways. God will like to collect those lenses and make sure that the lens of Jesus, okay, predates, you know, comes ahead of, you know, becomes preeminent over every other lens. That you and I will look at our lives, I will look at our interactions, we'll look at our experiences. And the first thing that God wants us to ask ourselves is, in my shoes, what will Jesus do? In my shoes, what did Jesus do? In my shoes, who was the one who represented Jesus and executed what you are doing in the light of what Christ will have done because he is in the light of the world. You know, and I think this is very important. So today, even though this is a thing we're going to be covering over the next few weeks, today I want us to address the topic, the topic that I will be starting with to lay the foundation for uh, looking at Christ's lens and, and, and positioning things this way is the centrality of Christ. Okay, the centrality of Christ. And I'm trusting God today that you know, you will hear, you will listen, you will find application. This will reorient your life, will direct and re-energize you and will help you prioritize the things that are important and it will help you live a laser-focused life, you know, that ensures that everything is done with the understanding of the role that Jesus Christ plays in all of history. If you are still with me today, you are listening, you are paying attention, just type in that chat box there, amen. Okay, and amen to those prayers as we look into God's word today and take it up one by one. Thank you very much for those saying amen. Now today, like I said, this is going to be a bit interactive, so I would like you to interact. I will ask a few questions. I will want you to answer. I'd like a few answers from here and there, okay, to basically say, you know what, I understand this. This is what I think about this. And I'm going to ask a variety of questions, so let's get ready. Uh, like I said, we're going to preach this message together. Uh, for me, I realize that the most important thing in the conversations of Jesus is not what I say. It is what God does, okay? Uh, it's what God does. And what God does is able to do best when we are involved and what we pick away from that place is memorable and is something we can take action on immediately as well. So I'm going to ask you, first, can we try and imagine what that this is a business or friendly meeting. You know, many times, the moments we say we are having a church gathering, we become unreal. We become pretentious. We become fake. We become less than we will be because we don't have enough Bible knowledge, because we don't have as much scriptures memorized as the pastor. We feel that we are different and we cannot contribute sufficiently. You know, but the moments we say, okay, look, let's be a friendly meeting. Let's just chat as friends. Let's chat business chat. Okay. The moment that becomes the outlook of how we're looking at things, what begins to happen is we'll participate more. We are likely to be more real, okay? We, are, we will not feel judged by what people, you know, what we say, whether it's in the Bible or not. If we hear something, we'll be very, that will be very helpful. We'll write it down and start implementing it. We will see that not everyone is superior to us based on anointing. We will expect each person based on their experience and their history, okay? We are going to be, it's going to be a really impactful and useful meeting. And there'll be no male or female, everyone will have something to contribute. So very quickly today in this place, I would like us to interact in this place with the mindset and understanding that this is not, you know, behave, behave as if it's a business meeting. 
behave as this is a family meeting and understand that we are having a conversation that you can contribute into. So if it was a meeting about business and we're talking about how to make sales and how to make things, everyone will have an idea because everyone has something that can relate. Please let us remove everything that makes you feel this is a religious meeting and let's have it in a normal meeting and let's discuss amongst ourselves and ask ourselves some fundamental questions because in that journey, we will come into clarity. We will have deep revelation of how God wants us to operate in the earth and then we'll be better. And of course, because many times all the meetings we have that are religious in nature only take about four hours in a week or maximum six. And in that week, we have 168 hours, which we can spend about 42 of them sleeping. And when we have spent for two hours sleeping, the hours we have awake, which is six hours per day, the hours we have awake is still about 122. Now, in this 122, we spend six in church and in fellowship meetings, we have 116 hours left. Now, guess what? God is very, very interested in those 116 hours because they form the majority of your life. And if whatever way we behave in those hours is the way we really are. And if we can transport that into this meeting, then we can transmit those values into wherever we find ourselves as well. You know, to say, you know what? This is how I will behave anywhere I am because everywhere I am, God is there. So very quickly, I'd like us to answer a few questions. And let's answer them very plainly without any religious toga, you know, on our minds or across our, you know, across our, our, our views. How can our lives be measured? Okay, so I have four questions today. What will make your what will make our lives really worthwhile? What will make our lives worthwhile? How can our lives be measured? What will make our lives fulfilling? Can you paint a picture of a successful life? Are there thoughts amongst the things that people have shared that look shared? So very quickly today, what will make your life really worthwhile? What will you have spent your time and your life doing that will you make you feel, mm, you know, this is a fulfilled life, this is a successful life? What parameters can we use to measure our lives? Is it the joy that we feel? Is it the money that we make? Is it how long we live? What are the parameters that really define how fulfilling a life will be? And I want one or two people to share their thoughts on this so that we can get a few thoughts in the place as we progress along. I don't want to just share what I think it will be. What do you think are the parameters by which our lives can be measured? You know, how can a human life be measured? You know, uh, and anybody can share. If you want to share, and type it, you can type it. If you want to speak, please just show me your hand and I will, will unmute you or, or say, or mute to me and I will mute you and you can share with us. You know, um, there's a very interesting song that I and my brother learned about 20 something years ago. Uh, it was a song that was sung in the movie Prince of Egypt. And it was, you know, trying to analyze the life of Joseph. Uh, and there was a song that was sung there that basically says, how can you measure the life of a man? Okay, how do you measure somebody's life? And you know, very interesting song. I think it was sung by Maria Carey or, or, or so, you know, and it gave you a little insight into how can we, you really measure somebody's life? Are you going to measure it in duration? Are you going to measure it in its, you know, in, in, its, in its acquisitions? Are you going to measure it in its donations? Are you go, what are you going to be able to measure a life by? Anybody, please, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like us to contribute to this. What do you think will make a life fulfilling? What will make your life fulfilling? What will you look at and say, hmm, this is what a successful life looks like, okay? Um, I know if I gave this question, in, you know, in the normal parlance, you say, look, you know, I, a good life is a life that is lived for, you know, a good duration, not too much, just, you know, sizable. It's a life that is able to, you know, uh, is not starved of resources, is not starved of what he needs, you know, to be able to do stuff with. And this is the conversation we'll have if I go, you know, out there and I don't put on the toga or cap, cap of a pastor. What I got to share with me today, how can lives be measured? What is important? What is valuable? What will you look at in a life and say, this life makes sense? You know, what will you look at and say, mm, this is fulfilling. This is a good use of life. Okay, and I'm, I'm grateful to God that we have grandmas in the house. We have grandpas in the house. People who have lived for 50, 60, 70 years. Okay, so what is a good life? What's a successful life? Okay, Dr. Um, Mrs. Ogulesi says, how much of God's plan for us we understand and key into, okay? Thank you very much for that thought. You know, um, how much of God's plans we understand and key into. Anybody else? Anybody else can you give us an expression that doesn't sound like, you know, like that sounds like the answer you will give in a business meeting. You know, they ask you in a business meeting, how will you know that this business is successful? 
How will you know that your business is successful? How do you know that your career is good? How do you know that your life was well lived? What are the parameters? Okay, so it says impact, being able to help confuse people who have direction, empower people who have skills with a platform to express their skills, having a home where people can walk into and feel safe and loved. Okay, thank you very much. Somebody says, so you miss this influence. Okay, good thoughts. Anybody else have anything you want to share? Please drop it in there so that we can add it to our community of thoughts. And if you want to share it verbally, you can share as well. Now, um, I think these are very huge questions. And I can understand why we don't have many people jump in on them because you ask yourself, how can you measure your life? You know, how can you measure a life that you don't know the beginning of? How do you measure a life that you don't know the end of? Because what this is relationship. Okay, you can measure a life by the relationships that they're able to keep and the possibly the impact on those relationships. How much people around you have been affected? Okay, how much have affected people that are around you positively? Very lovely, lovely thoughts. Okay, very good. And people are, people are rising up to it. Now, so if you look at all these parameters, I'm still waiting for the person who will say, how much money? It's not featuring. Or someone who will say, how long does it live? It's not featuring. What we can find here is impact, is service, is how you are a blessing, if this is really what a successful life will be measured by, how you impact everyone you meet with something to affect their lives in the last in lasting ways, if this is it, we, got, we have a common theme already. And that common theme is, it's not about you. It's about somebody else. It's about the impact you're able to make, the difference you're able to make, and those exact same things. Now let's take that journey a little further and look at something very interesting. Let's play with a few metaphors, okay? Uh, let's imagine I go to visit a friend in the US for two weeks. What can make my stay awesome? And what can make it terrible? So I'm saying, let's not even measure the whole of life. Let's measure a little visit, okay? Let's measure a little visit. I go to America to visit a friend and I'm spending two weeks. And in those two weeks, what will make me say that was a good meeting? And what would make me say that was a horrible visit? If you look at those two weeks, it is still the same things we are mentioning here. How did our conversations go? How did I feel safe? Did I feel positively impacted? Did I feel like it was worthwhile? Did I enjoy myself? Was there an opportunity to connect with this person again and restore our fellowship? Were we able to deliberate on things that makes my life easier, make their life easier? Were they a blessing to me? Was I a blessing to them? In two weeks, I can measure those two weeks. It will not be because of the luxury that my friend is living. It will not be because of how fantastic their houses are. I will not come back and talk about how beautiful their dining table was. I will come back and talk about the impact that I enjoyed from those conversations. They will leave, what will live on with them in that place was the impact that my visit also helped them achieve. The bigger picture they were able to see, the difference that I was able to make in a two weeks journey. Let's say I undertake a project. What can make the investments worthwhile or a total bummer will be that when I did the project, I met with people, I had interactions, and the project that we're working on is a project that is valuable to people. That I will not rate my project on how much money was spent on it or how much money came out from it, but what is the impact that that project has on their lives? Who are the people I came into contact with while doing that project? That these are the things I will pay attention to in that project. And if the project fails and returns no result, I will look at it and say, okay, what did this experience teach me? Am I better off for it in a project? Now let's look at the career. What will make my career amazing? And what can make me look back with regret? What will I say for 30 years I worked in this bank? What will make me look back and say it was a fantastic career? It will not likely be how much I made in 30 years because I will have lost count. It will not be who was my boss at first. You know, it will be whose life did mine touch? And what difference did I make? Which relationship did I build? And what difference did it make? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm giving us all of these metaphors so that we can begin to have an understanding of how life can be measured. That my career will be a total regret if after doing it for 30 years, I still do not feel fulfilled. I still do not feel happy. I still think back and wonder, did I make the wrong decision? Maybe I should have gone in another path apart from this other path. Maybe I should have trans, you know, journeyed differently. I look back at my life and I ask, what did this 30 years amount to? It's not what I was able to take out as an amount, but what did I amount to? What difference did I make in people's lives by virtue of the way I spend this time? Okay. How much have I made a difference in the people that crossed my life? 
How many have I enjoyed God? How many have I made a difference? So we're measuring our lives by these very brief metaphors. Very good. Let's take it for that a little bit. Let's look close at home. Okay, so let's come home now. How will you rate your life so far? What are the highlights of your life? And I'd like us to re respond here. Okay, please feel free, respond. We are family. We want to share, we want to learn. Our contribution is what makes us gain value, not really what we hear. As adults, we don't get blessed by what we hear as much as our own getting involved, thinking through our lives and making our contribution. So please, I would like you to type something and share here. How will you rate your life so far? What are the highlights of your life? What can you look back at your life and say, mm, I enjoyed this season. I enjoyed this time because this time grew me. This time allowed me to work with teenagers. This time allowed me to make a difference in university students. This time allowed me to be able to impact the next generation. This time allowed me to be able to teach people how to see Jesus this way. What are the highlights of your life? What are the things you can look back at your life and say, mm, if the graph of my life will be drawn, these are the places that will have spikes. These are the places where it will go up. What are the highlights of your life? What do you wish you did more of? Okay, you can answer any of these three questions. What do you wish you did more of? What, if you look back at your life, what will you say? Ah, I wish I did more of this. I wish I spent more time on this. Answer that question, ladies and gentlemen. What do I wish I did more of? And what do I wish I did less of? Where have I gone into overdrive that I shouldn't have gone into? Where did I drive insufficiently that I should have driven more into? I like us to answer these three questions and look closer home to our own lives. We have used metaphors. We have analyzed other people. We have looked outside. Now let's look inside and ask ourselves, how will I rate my life so far? What are the highlights of my life? Okay, and I look back at my life. I look at seasons in my life where I found the greatest joy, where I found the greatest fulfillment, and where I felt the most successful. It wasn't because of how much was in my bank account. No, it was because of how many lives I was directly responsible for. Okay, I, it was about the time when I can look at Job 29 and I can read that proverb, uh, that, 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 that Job 29 and see what Job was talking about. And I can I could feel the same as well, that unto me to men give here and listen to my counsel. After I spoke, they spoke not after. You know, when I spoke with them and I guided them, I was eyes to the blind, I was feet to the lame. I helped the one that didn't have direction, I gave direction. I helped the one that was struggling academically, I gave them a reason to have hope. That the highlights of our lives are the seasons when we are impacting others. That God has designed us in interesting ways where I do not derive my greatest joy from the exams I passed and the scholarships I got and the high, you know, offers I get. But my life is measured in service. My life is measured, the highlights of my life are when, you know, I'm going back to campuses every year. The highlight of my life is when I'm pouring myself into the life of others and seeing them grow. The highlight of my life is when I sit down and listen to testimonies of growth and development of people that have impacted one way or the other. What is the highlight of your life and what do you wish that you did more of? Okay, I'm having a few comments here and it says, um, when people share how they are better, be, became closer in their relationship with God because of my relationship with me. Awesome. I enjoy the relationship that I'm, be, be, I'm beginning to learn the hidden treasure in challenging relationships. Okay, now that I'm very sure that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, I want to make impact in influencing the younger generation positively. I have received so much spiritually, physically, and socially. So this is being a tutor in my little sphere. I wish I can do more, bringing more youth to Christ using my field of knowledge. Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, if you will look back at your life and you realize these are the things I wish I did more, then when, when are we postponing when we will do them too? And I want to show you something. You know, we're going somewhere with this, the very simple direct message, and I pray that we will take lessons from this and we'll be able to move forward very boldly based on the things that God will share to us. Mm. Now, listen to this very, very interesting example. If God told you today that today is your last day, but you will have an extension of five years based on the quality of what you will do with your life, what are the things you will present to God as what you will spend the next five years of your life doing? Okay, if you suddenly came on to, to realize that today is your last day, and God says, I'm going to give you an extension of five years, but give me a proposal of what you will want to use those five years for. What are the things that you will want to do? 
What are the things you will present to God and say, God, if I have five more years, these will be my priority. If I have five more years on this planet, these are the things that I will spend my energy and my time on. Someone says, I want to relate more with people, seeing them in Christ as Christ sees them. That way I can meet them at the level and no matter how low, and draw them closer to me and consequently to Jesus. Okay? Someone says, I am blessed when people are blessed through my efforts. I am happy when people are blessed through my efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have five years more to live, sometimes we live our lives carelessly, like we have 90 more years to live, like we have 40 more years to live. If I know for a fact that God is saying to me, Diolu, I don't know what your plan for 20 years, 30 years is. I have five more years to give you. And in those five years, what are the things you want to spend your time, your energy, and your investment on? Because I am coming for you. And I want you to make your maximum contribution, your maximum success. You want you to deliver the life of your dreams, the best you can have in the next five years. What will you spend your life upon? Now, some of these answers are already reflecting and showing what it is. And it doesn't matter whether you are a believer or not a believer, you will realize that there's a common thread that connects what we have been designed by God to derive pleasure from. Okay? That's what we have been designed by God to derive pleasure from. There's a lot that is going on that way, and we are all in one way or the other, you know, attesting to those realities. Now, let's do a trend analysis. I want you, I want you to see something very interesting. Uh, and I did this trend analysis because it gives us an idea of what is important. So, number one, let's say, for example, we ask ourselves, after I've died, five years after I die, what have I done that will be remembered? Five years. Some people died for one year and they are forgotten. Some people have gone for two years and they are history. Five years after you leave this planet, nobody will remember your financial status. Nobody will remember your class in society. Nobody will remember your state of origin, your village of origin, nobody's going to care much about that. People are going to remember you for certain things. What do you think those things are? What do you think will be important in five years? Okay? And you can, we can live right, by God's grace, we'll live to ripe old ages of 90, 100, 120, like Moses. After we have lived and we have passed on to eternity, five years after, what do you think people will remember? They will remember the impact you had on their lives. They will remember how they felt in your presence. They will remember what you prioritized and shared with them. They will remember what value you added. They will remember what difference you made. They will remember how you helped. They will remember how you made them feel five years. Very good stuff. 50 years after that you have left, what will you be remembered for? 50 years. Now, five years means the people that related directly with you are still present. 50 years means the people that related with you who had a little bit of an idea about you, who met you in the later side of your life and when they were in too early in their lives for it to make much sense to them, what will they have to remember you by? And if you want to answer that question correctly, ask yourself who has died 50 years ago that I still remember. Who has gone 50 years ago that I still remember? Okay, and if you look at the names of the people that I still remember that I've gone 50 years ago, it wasn't only because they made your life interesting. It wasn't about how they made you feel. It wasn't about anything that they did to you because you probably couldn't have even felt anything if they died 50 years ago. That what you remember about them are the legacies they left behind and it's not the legacy of good character. It's not a legacy of Omoluabi. No. It's a legacy connected to a higher legacy. It's something that transcends life as we see it normally. The people you remember from a few years ago, and think about it, are people who had something to do with their impact that wasn't limited to just them directly. So, for example, you it will shock you that you know most of the very, very important people in Nigeria who are the founders of Nigeria have not even gone for 50 years. What lasts for that long goes beyond trying to set your nation free, goes beyond trying to do things that are good in themselves. It has to connect with the higher legacy. And in case you are not seeing it very clearly, yeah, if you're not seeing it very clearly, let's make it 500 years. And ask yourself, who do you know that existed 500 years ago 
whose lives are still relevant till today. And you will find out that the lives that are relevant today after they had died 500 years ago are the lives who had value they added to Jesus' agenda. So somebody says, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Amen. That you realize that the more you spend time and you increase the parameters of time on your life, you will realize that every other thing will fade away. That every other impact will fade away. Every other value will fade away. The only thing that will hold and will last is what you did as a contribution to an agenda that transcends your time. Five hundred years ago, the names I can remember five hundred years ago are the names whose contribution makes them relevant to my faith. There are people who, by virtue of the work they did, you have King James, who participated in authoring the Bible 500 years ago. You have people like Martin Luther, the reformer, who said, no way, we need to be justified by faith and reminded us of the words of Habakkuk and took us back to the words of, of, of Apostle Paul. But 500 years ago, 500 years ago, we can remember Paul, we can remember James, we can remember John, we can remember Peter, we can remember those people based on the contribution they had to the work of Christ. Now, when Jesus Christ said it is finished, or oh, oh, it was finished, but as soon as it's finished, something new began. There's an agenda, there's a mission, there's a cause. And ladies and gentlemen, the only thing that will count one day is nothing that you did in your own self, but what is done for Jesus. In eternity, what matters? I'd like you to understand this very clearly because this is so, so crucial. You know, you will realize that in eternity, everybody's work, the Bible says literally that everybody's work will be tested with fire. It means they are going to, there's going to be a metaphor for your work. There's going to be a metaphor for my work and our works will be set on fire. And some of our so-called impact are impact, but they are dry leaves. Some of our impacts, they are impact for real, but they are straws. Some of our impacts are impact for, for real, but they are dry wood. And the only impacts that are gold, the only impact that are treasure are the ones that are done in association with true treasure. And when our works are set on fire, every impact that does not connect with eternal value will burn away and only, only those that are connected with eternal value will stand. In eternity, what will matter? Shortly, one year after, maybe how much resources you left and who you give inheritance to. Five years down the line is how you made them feel. Future down the line is what they can remember of your legacy. Five years down the line is what you have done for Christ. In eternity, what will count is what has been done for Christ. And in case it's not clear to you, let us go back in time and understand a few very interesting features of history. And realize that, let's go one by one and look at a few key elements. One, creation. Now, it's very interesting the way creation is that there's been arguments on earth where people say, is there a creator? Where people say, was man created by a big bang? Is the universe without direction? Okay, careful study shows that creation, anybody who spends time to look at creation and understand creation realizes that creation demands a creator. That the world system is too organized, is too precise, is too dependent on the number of factors that need to be accurate for you to say that the, the world banged into existence. Ladies and gentlemen, if the earth moves away from its current orbit by as much as one meter, we can be fried. By as much as one meter in the other direction, it can be too cold and unbearable. That the way God has structured how the earth will revolve around the sun and that it is around the sun that it will revolve already shows that there's a mastermind behind creation that ensures that we have the exact right composition of oxygen, the right composition of nitrogen, and the right composition of carbon dioxide to ensure that life can be sustained on this planet. That God has designed this universe in such a way that if the earth tilts, the earth is tilted, and if the earth tilts, is suddenly altered a little bit, it changes everything. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to me from the comfort of your home, sitting down on your chair, and imagining that everything is calm and in one position. But if you think about it deeply, everyone seated everywhere they are sitting today listen to me is moving at the speed of 1,700 kilometers per hour. That is 10 times faster than the car when you press your accelerator to the limit. 
10 times faster is the way you are moving today because the earth under you is moving at that speed. Ladies and gentlemen, if anything goes wrong in the calculation of how the key elements of the planet Earth was put together goes out of order, you and I will recognize that there must be a creator. Now, not only is the world, the universe, and all the galaxies, the stars, the moons, and the whole structure of planetary forces perfect, even the human body is a wonder. Now, what is taking place in the human body, somebody of very high intelligence, you know, who program says the human body runs like a program. There must be a programmer behind it. The Bible says there are two Bibles. There's the one that you and I read, and there's the one that nature provides. There is nobody who has an excuse and can say that God does not exist except the person is a fool. The Bible says a fool says in that there is no God because it requires a new level of stupidity to be able to look around, see the beauty of nature, and imagine, and actually voice it out and say that there is no God. Scientists did a research and they found out that the human DNA, that DNA that is found in the single cell that was conceived when a baby was, was, was formed and that begins to multiply, the amount of information in that DNA is enough, is as many as stacking books from the earth to the moon 500 times. The amount of data it can contain. And it's as small as a pinhead and it can contain more than gigabytes Mega has terabytes that we struggle hard to force fit into hard drives. Ladies and gentlemen, the fact that there is a creation that is so absolutely perfect in his design shows that there is a creator. And because we know there's a creator, we know there's a super intelligent creator behind the scenes of the world. And that creator is a that, that creation is a Bible that points regularly at God. And because we know that there is a visible form in which you can recognize God and his name is Jesus. We realize from creation that Jesus Christ is not feeding from creation. Number two, the Bible. And I don't know if you, if you celebrate or realize how, how exciting this Bible is, how amazing this book is. This Bible has 6,000 years of man's history with genealogies from Adam to Jesus that are about four, two generations. I'd like you to understand this. How many of us can count our genealogy past 10? If you are here and you can count your father, your father's father, your father's father, and you can go up as far as 10, you deserve a medal. Rarely will you find human beings that are able to do 10. The Bible gives you history that could only have been preserved by God. Gives you genealogy gives you who best who gives you a record that is unbelievable my grandfather wrote some things my grandfather is not up to 100 years away from my age my grandfather died when my dad was 11 my grandfather so if i if i pursue my age about 100 years ago he was still around he wrote some things he documented some things about his business about his the things he was doing with herbs and in in my generation we can't even find what he wrote for the Bible to have been preserved, to have the commentaries from Adam, to have the commentaries from Moses, to go ahead into the journeys of Joseph, of David, of Nehemiah, of Esther, of all of those people, and put it all together, and put it all together, and put it all together till this day, and Jesus Christ will come and say, these scriptures is not about history, it's not about genealogy, it's not about anything else. Everything you find in this compendium was to introduce you to me. Jesus Christ is saying, I am central to scriptures. We have said he is central to creation. He is central to the most accurate compendium of data. The biggest available data in the world is central to it. And it says, it's all about me. That Jesus Christ is central to scriptures. Let's look at history. There are many religions in the world, post-dating Christianity, predating Christianity, all over the place. Human beings were not able to define their history on any other parameters but before Christ and after his death. Making it very clear to everyone in the world that history, even history, is his story. That our history is calibrated in before Christ and after his death because he is also central to history. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm giving you reasons why what will count 
Because what counts in history is what is linked to Jesus. What will count in eternity is what is done for him. All the deceptions of Satan on world religion is a battle of making Jesus Christ less supreme than he is, less sovereign than he is, less God than he is, less preeminent than he is, and less central than he is. I was doing it with Satan as well, and I found something very, very interesting. Okay? That in technological advancement began to happen in Europe, began to happen in the US, and there was a lot of boom. There are three categories of countries. There are countries that produce, that invent technology. There are countries that are cheap, that have cheap, cheap labor, that can produce technology, and there are countries that consume technology. And if you look at the places where technology originated from, one very interesting discovery was made. And what was that discovery? Research shows that there's a connection between technological advancement and biblical literacy. Something happened which set the stage for science and technology to emerge in full force. And it sounds strange because it looks like, you know, faith and science usually try to fight against each other, but it was realized that the evidence returned to biblical Christianity in these countries is what created the boom for technological advancement. And that's it. They call it the, uh, uh, the, uh, the epistemological development of technology. It's showing that there's a foundation. The moment man began to question and ask and realize that there's a creator, a careful, deliberate creator, they began to open their minds into the realm of things that are possible. That man began to find his own creative instrument and his own creative drive from understanding that the moment the Isaac Newtons of this world, the Pascal Blazes of this world, and the core scientists who had strong biblical roots began to look at their world in a different way and not just take on the authoritative, you know, authoritative and logical postulations of the Plato's and the Aristotle and, and, and the Aristot Aristot was when they began to create that biblical literacy, biblical Christianity played a very vital role, even in the images of technology. So even in technology, we find Christ's centrality. Jesus is central to the past, he is central to the present, and he is indeed central to the future. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how you are organizing or structuring your life, but we need to understand this. That a day is coming when everything will not matter because many things do not matter in time. Ah, I'm looking for children. It has taken me 10 years. I'm not giving birth to children. The day you gave birth to children, it doesn't matter anymore that it took 10 years. The time becomes an opportunity for husband and wife to bond together, pray together, seek God together, love up on each other. That child changes the equation on the time that it took. That on the day that Christ is revealed, when all of humanity come to terms that he is Lord of all and King of kings, and that he reigns supreme over all, on the day that revelation becomes, becomes known, you will realize that many things that we labor and draw sweat from do not matter so much. So what does this mean? It means if I'm doing business, it must be with the centrality of Christ. If I'm in a marriage, I must centralize Christ in that marriage. If I am in a relationship with people, I must relate with them because of my relationship with Christ. I must realize that in all that I engage in, in my career, in my visit, in my interaction, in my business, in my teamwork, in my collaboration, everything I do, the central figure who holds it all together, I need to get at his Christ and learn to see it from his lens. Amen. And I want to show you just the scripture and then I'll bring it to a close tonight, today. Colossians 1, 15 to 20 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and invisible. Say with me everything. Everything was created by him. He is the creator. He is the maker of all things. He's talking about Jesus. He says, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Everything was created by him. Everything was created through him. Everything was created for him. Now, if you want to talk about, you know, by him, through him, and for him, we can spend, we can spend, somebody, I, I read some analysis, there, we can spend two and a half years discussing this. The Bible says, he is before all things, and by him, all things hold together. He is also the head of the body of the church. He is beginning, he is the beginning, the first one from the dead, 
so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, until Christ takes his rightful place in your life, everything else that you labor for and squander your energy and time for will be meaningless in time. I like the way Message Nation puts it. He says, we look at the sun and see God who cannot be seen. We look at the sun and we see God's original purpose in everything created. You want to understand God's purpose? It's in Christ. Look at him. He says, for everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, rank after rank after rank of angels, everything God started in him finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. And when it comes to the church, it organizes and holds it together like a head does the body. He was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade. He is supreme in the end from beginning to end. He's there, towering over everything and everyone. So spacious is he, so expansive that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death. His blood poured down from the cross. Ladies and gentlemen, until you and I come into a deep revelation of the fact that what holds the world in a calm, what creates a a scenario where tornadoes are not blowing up everywhere, where earthquakes are not messing up everywhere, where countries are not disintegrating to their wars, where animal instincts are not taking over every government of the earth, what keeps the world safe and still keeps everything intact is because he holds it together. And he holds it together as a head holds the body together by his church. And it is what the church holds together as a body that is held together. That a day is coming. A day is coming when the, that is called the day of the Lord, when he will appear. And, and on that day, the reason why every knee will bow is because he will come in the revelation of who he is full, of who he fully is. So that everybody can get to understand and see that you know what this is Jesus. This is his Lord. And it is it is his absence that creates chaos, and it is his presence that creates harmony. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I are favored, we are privileged. To know him. We are privileged and favored to be in a relationship with him. We have the opportunity of having him as our master, as our brother, as our friend, to be joint heirs with him. Ladies and gentlemen, if we do not realize this, when we know that all of life, past, present, and future, is integrated into him, then we must realize one thing that is only what you do to advance the cause of Jesus that will count in eternity. And it's very simple, ladies and gentlemen. The questions are simple. Are you making disciples? Are you abiding in him? Are you investing in his cause? When the curtain of time is drawn and all the works that we have labored for are weighed, not just five years after our demise, not just 50 years, not just 500, but on eternal timelines. When the king of kings and the lord of laws, the judge of all the earth, the one who is just and the one who is merciful and whose mercies do not prevent his justice and his justice do not prevent his mercy. When we stand before him for all our works on this side of eternity to be measured, what will count is, did you know me? Did I know you? Did our relationship bring forth fruit? Did you advance his course? And ladies and gentlemen, the work is finished. It means all that God requires from us it's a surrender to his spirit. It's a surrender to his lordship. It's a surrender to his leadership so that we can join him in the work that he does. He has given us grace. He has called us priests. He said that the sacrifice we bring today is not the sacrifice of bulls and rams, but the sacrifice of offering prayers on behalf of others and offering God to others on behalf of God. We are now become logistic officers who run errands for God 
into people's lives are able to forgive them and God has forgiven them, are able to call them and invite them and God has invited them. Are you making disciples? Is every platform you have an opportunity for you to teach others this way of life? Are you abiding with him? Are you resting with him? Are you listening to him? Do you enjoy fellowship with him? Ladies and gentlemen, it's only what we do for him that counts in eternity. And I want us to remind us today that Jesus is central. You and I have the opportunity of knowing that he is central. One day, those who do not know will know. And there's no excuse because night unto night, uttered speech, day unto day gives counsel. There's no language where there are, there's, no, there's no tribe, there's no tongue where their language is not understood. There is no human being who can say, God was never revealed to me because God is revealed in our everyday interaction, even when Jesus is not spoken. And you and I have the responsibility of ensuring that nobody has an excuse before God because everyone we meet we will tell about this way of life because that's the essence of our living and the real impact we will make in their lives transcends just the impact of making them feel better. It goes into having their eternity in mind and recognizing that the biggest thing I can ever do for a human being is to bring him into a deep friendship with the one I consider the greatest friend of all times. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible got printed. It was first of all written. It took painful, painful exercise to duplicate scriptures. The first printing press was invented so that Bible can be printed. The ideas and technological ideas to create such engines was given by God because people must search for scriptures. If you go and look for the highest search things, you will realize that every technological advancement is a conspiracy to ensure that no man will be without excuse, that the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. You and I have a role to play. I pray that God will grant us grace to live up to what God has a portion for us and to do the things that will count in eternity. In Jesus' name. Let us pray. I'd like us to take words to God this evening and pray and say, God, I want my life to count in eternity. I don't want my work to be burnt with fire and for nothing to be left behind. I want the work that I do to, 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 to count. I want Christ's centrality to be strong to be clear to me. I want Christ, you know, I want it to be real to me. And I want to begin to operate and live my life with the understanding that the only thing that will stand, the only thing that will count after time is no more is what I did by the help of your Holy Spirit. Is what I surrendered myself to be useful to you to make a difference in other people's lives. Help me, dear God. Let this be the reality of my life. For in Jesus' name we pray. And if anybody here who feels, God, I have let you down, I have wasted time, I have wasted life, and I want to repent of it and ask for your grace, let's go ahead and ask for his grace today. And say, God, your words is you are able to make all grace abound towards me, so that after I have sufficiency in all things, I can abound in every good work. This is good work, and it can only be done by your grace. I ask for grace, for grace to be more impactful, to grace to, 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 to be more friendly with you and deeper with you, so that it is not struggle to bring people into your friendship. Pour your full oil afresh upon me. Let my lips be seasoned. Let my mouth speak forth your fire. Let, my, let your truth be as burning coals in my mouth. Let your word come forth and let it be laced with, let it be laced with, with barbed wire. Let it, be, let it latch onto the ears of the hearers you know, in the name of Jesus. Cause me to speak your words, your convicting words and to impact lives in ways that connect them with you eternally. Let it not be a struggle for me, O oh God. Let us pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.